a member of our uh, organization, um, you can email me at the address up here, um, grwtg2008, and uh, we'll uh, we can forward you the information to become a member. We have um, uh, lots of nice demos coming up. Um, some of these demos will be for members only, um, but a lot of these we just um, open our doors to anybody who logs in and asks for uh, permission. We have a couple people today that had contacted us through Facebook that wanted to come in, so we you know we send out our email and let them come and join the meeting. Um, so if if you if you're encouraged to be a member, our, our dues are only twenty five dollars. That's a year. Um, that's for the the year 2020. So everybody who's joined in this past year, uh, we renew our dues every every January. So um, and then we'll have an opportunity with a discount. And we decided we're still going to do that in December, where we let everybody renew their dues for twenty dollars for the year 2021, which um, is uh, definitely the cheapest guild around. So. Um, so yeah, we encourage you to join us and get on our email list so you uh, don't miss any of our events and stuff. Um, on going down our business here, um, um, New City Kids, we were going to be working with them in November. Um, we did that a year ago where uh, uh, we uh, had eight of them come down and they all turned the bowl that they went home with. Um, it went over fantastic. There was a lot of positive results from that. Uh, the New City Kids is a is a group in Grand Rapids for um, I think not challenge kids but kids of uh, how do you describe that Tom Tom Pennegar are you in the room? They're high risk kids. There there you go high risk. Um, so yeah they're they're high risk of what dropping out of school right? Your mic's off. Your mic's off, Tom. I can find him here. I'll try and on now. Oh, your mic's on, Tom. It's his, his it shows his mic's on, but I can't hear him, so I don't know what happened there. Your mic was working, but it stopped working. Okay. Well, it's a it's a group of kids, and I believe they're high risk of not uh, not making it through high school without dropping out. So um, I will um, um, let's see. I have a message here that our audio is low. Is does everybody can everybody hear me just fine? Well, your audio is fine. I think maybe he needs to uh, adjust the audio audio on a setup for his. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I gotta say, I kind of checked it earlier, and it said it, it looked like our audio was okay. So, you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Tom, you've got the floor. Tell us about Sorry. New City Kids. <laughs> uh, it focuses on high school students that are in the what we call the middle sixty. They're uh, not the twenty percent that don't need help, and not the twenty percent that need too much, a lot more individual attention. But they focus on. The middle 60, they've been in operation for 14 years. Uh, all of the kids in 14 years that stayed in the program graduated from high school and all but one went on to college and that one joined the military. So they have a great success ratio of uh, teaching kids to be teachers of middle school and intermediate. And we wanna get them more into learning skills so wood turning is just one great opportunity to realize that there's a lot of a lot of different things that people can get into so it worked they had a lot of fun turning the bowls and i think the mentors who taught them had at least as much fun as uh, the the kids did and i i was talking to a girl the other day and she was talking how surprised her family was and she said look what i made you know so she was excited Okay, and then uh, so, but new on our list with the new city kids is um, we dr we dropped the uh, the the class we were going to do with them in November, but now we've added on in uh, I think I think it was December um, a silent auction that they do to uh, provide funds for the new city kids. And uh, now come back on, Tom. Tell us about this auction, the silent auction so, we decided we we're going to get involved with. So. 
we are going to donate pieces that they will auction off either in a in-person uh, silent auction or an online um, uh, silent auction. And the proceeds would go to New City Kids. So we'd like to get 20 or 30 nice pieces that uh, we can put into this auction that uh, a lot of hopefully well-heeled people will bid on and uh, we can raise funds that way. Okay. If you have any questions about it, you can contact me. Okay. And we'll have more of that as we get closer, but um, keep that in mind that we'll be looking for some uh, donations of some nice turn pieces, you know, um, that they can, uh, that they can auction off. And I, and from what he, Tom said and what he's, I think he's been there in the past that these are, they go for pretty good money, right, Tom? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, that was our, uh, that was the only business that I really have right now. Um, let me cross that off my list so I don't back up and do it again. And, um, the, uh, Today we have a demonstration with Bruce Dannenhauer. He's going to do a, a staved bead box. So we're looking forward to that here in a little bit after we get done with show and tell. Um, next month, August, we have Greg Gallegos, or Gallegos. I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name. Um, he's going to do a thin-walled vessel with uh, embellishments. And he, he says, you know, I, I microwave it, I, I bleach it, I carve it, um, I dye it, I do everything. So he's going to hopefully try to... Um, cover a lot of different embellishments, plus he's going to turn this thin-walled vessel for us. So that'll be next month in August. Um, in September, we have Tom Sampson yet, and I don't know what Tom's brewing, but he'll have something by next meeting. I'll be pushing him to uh, let us know what he's doing, unless you know right now, Tom. Are you here, Tom? You know what you're doing? I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep, you're on. I'm uh, I'm thinking sandblasting. I've been uh, playing around with sandblasting, so see if we can make that work. All right, cool. That's uh, something I've been thinking about doing, so I'm glad to hear that. So that'll be, uh, I'm going to write that down so I don't forget. So Tom will be doing sandblasting. Um, in November, we have Phil Irons lined up from uh, from uh, Britain. Um, I don't know uh, what we have him doing yet, he, we, but we know we're on his schedule. So as we get closer to that, um, our... Um, our uh, our um, demonstration team, couldn't think of that. Our demonstration team, which is Joe Spry's and and uh, and John Singleton, they will uh, reach out to Phil and figure out what we want and what we want to see. And uh, so uh, that'll be coming in November, um, December. Um, we're going to have uh, we're going to do something on Christmas gifts, and we'll be looking for uh, two or three or maybe four members that can do a do either turn a gift shortly something you know like a 10 minute easy turning or they can show the pieces and describe this nice christmas gift but we're going to be looking for three or four members that can uh, that can do that and uh, that'll be our demonstration in december and then uh we're still working to try to get um Cindy Drozda online we 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 were trying to get her for december but her schedule filled up fast so we're looking to get her on hopefully in uh, January, maybe February. I don't know if Joe's, he was going to try and contact her, but I don't know if that's, I'm sure she was yeah, really We're still busy. working it out, Doug. Okay. I'm, I'm sure she's busy. I didn't know she did. Uh, she, she is. She was live last week with the virtual symposium, and then she's been doing follow-ups with that all this week. So yeah. Uh, but hopefully we can get her on our schedule for January or February, and then that'll, That'll bring us into the year 2021, where we start this all over again. Um, let's see. So that's everything I have on my list here. Um, you know, we are looking for just general people who might want to do a demonstration. Um, you'll see today, um, Bruce has got our equipment that we bought. And uh, I, um, we did a run through the other day, and it looks really good. Um, so that would that's what we're going to be sending out to people, members of our group that are willing to do a demonstration for us. Um, uh, you know, I ran out to Bruce's house on, uh, I think, Monday. And I, you know, we wore our masks. We tried to keep our social distance and set things up and uh, make sure everything was working. So I ran out there and set it up. And then uh, he's running it today. And then I'm going to pick that up 
you know, in, in the next week or two, and then run that out to Greg Galagos. He's also going to do a demonstration using our equipment. Um, so if you are in our group and you like, hey, I would like to do a demonstration for you guys um, using our equipment, and you probably need to have a shop that's wired or a shop that's within 300 feet of your uh, your internet. Uh, that's what we did with Bruce. We we have bought a 300 foot spool of Cat Six Ethernet cable that we ran from Bruce's shop to his uh, to his uh, internet access in the house. And you can, when you see him do his demonstration, you'll see how clear that is, and how well that's working for us. So, um, and we can, we're we're looking for other people who who say, yeah, I I would like to do a demonstration. I have high speed internet, um, you know, that I can get that's within 300 foot of my shop. So. If you're in there, let me know. Contact me or somebody on the board, and uh, inter, you know, send me an email. We 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 try to send out enough emails. You could just reply to an email that Steve has sent out, and uh, it'll get back to me. So moving on down, we're going to move into show and tell. So if you have got a piece for show and tell that you would like to um, that you would like to uh, show to everybody. Um, Raise your hand. If you've sent me pictures, um, don't raise your hand. I will just pull those up after we do everybody else, and then I will call through and, and bring, bring stuff up um, and, and call you as we, as we get there because I know who you are that has sent me pictures. So raise your hand, and I will uh, we'll tag you and give you the floor and let you show us what you have for, um, what you have for um, show and tell. So first up, let me get my screen up here. I've got Bruce. Um, so let's let's get Bruce on and uh, uns uh, go ahead and unmute your mic and tell us what you got, Bruce. Well, my show and tell is uh, in response to your um, club challenge to turn a platter. And uh, I'm gonna do a screen share. So this is, uh, this is the bladder, it's Jerry, and uh, it's about 12 inches in diameter. It uh, was turned from a, um, oh, there it is. Um, it was turned from a, uh, there's the thickness on it, and the backside and that, <clears throat> that dark area you're seeing is part of the, uh, the outside of the tree, this was, turn from a piece of wood that the sawlers call a skin. So this is the first slice off the log where they're squaring the log up. And um, there's the actual piece. And I'm showing this for two reasons. One is that's the, that is the thickness that I had to work with at that point. So on that area right behind it is where that, where that brown is that we were talking about. And the other thing is, uh, I just wanted to point out that at this point, all I'm doing is um, centering the piece up on the lathe. I have it on the pins of the drive cup in the uh, live center to um, work towards getting it balanced and that type of thing. And because of this thickness or lack of thickness, I had to try to make sure that I've got this edge, which is where the uh, first cut was done, as perpendicular as possible. Otherwise, I'd end up cutting that away, trying to uh, get it flattened out. And these are just a couple more views of the piece of wood before I started spinning it. And off of the, uh, there was an off cut of the piece. This is uh, Platter's little brother. It's about six inches in diameter out of the same wood. And there's a little worm path right here and one right here. <clears throat> but I don't know if it adds good character to it or not. That's the bottom side of it with a little texturing, um, thanks to Matt. So that, uh, that's my show and tell. All right. Um, next up, I got Tom Penninga. What do you got for us, Tom? Are we supposed to do the challenge now, too? Yeah, it's all just part of show and tell. Okay. Well, this is what I was going to show. I've been working on this for about a month, but these are rolling pins I made with, uh, they're made out of hard maple, and I used an old Sears router crafter to put the spirals in, and then I 
put it in a PVC pipe and cast it with a Luma light and took it out of the PVC and turned it to its final diameter. And uh, they turned out really nice, but I have a lot of work into each one. So uh, that's my show and tell. Um, my uh, uh, hold on, my platter is. Can you see that? See this one? Yep. Can you see that platter? Yep, we can see it. That is an advent wreath that I made out of uh, it's the first really serious off center turning I did because these are all part of the same piece of wood. And when you're this far off center, you got a lot of stuff flopping around. <laughs> it's really kind of scary. Um, and I think I, well, that's the wrong way. Hold on. Uh, the bottom of the platter. Um, the only way I can get it to hold is to put a hole through it and actually uh, mount it through a hole on a large piece of plywood uh, table that I had so that I could keep the thing from flopping off my lathe. So anyway, it's going to somebody who wanted an advent wreath. Okay, very How nice. Is that Tom? Yeah. How big is that? What's the uh, diameter of that? The platter is uh, 12 and a half inches. And, and okay. then I found a great lady in uh, Granville who do laser engraving on it. So she put the words in it for me. So when you off center mounted that, Tom, yeah, did, uh, did you um, mount that to a like a a larger piece of plywood that kind yeah. of acted as a counterbalance? No, not as a counterbalance. I had a like a twenty a nineteen inch piece of plywood mounted to a face plate, and I drilled a hole through that at the diameter of those offsets, and then I ran a bolt through the center and tighten it up on both sides. So the whole whole platter was going around like this. Okay. Yeah, I've done those. And then on the opposite side of the plywood, I bolted a weight to kind of like offset, offset yeah, that, the, the balance, that like balancing, like balancing a tire. So yeah, but, you got to yeah. keep your fingers and hands in when you're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that sounded like a helicopter in your shop yeah. when you fired that up. Remember Tom Sampson when he uh, turned that uh, <clears throat> piece, he showed us how to use the counterweights. Right. Oh, okay. I missed that one. Um, okay, now we have John McGee. Uh, you're on, John. What do you got for us? You hear me? Yep. Yep. Okay, this is a uh, piece of birch, and you can see the. Uh, reverse myself here this dark area is the was where the two parts of the birch were growing up it was at a fork in the trunk and i decided i would see what i could do with that and i sort of uh moved carefully i kept good wood outside it all the way until i got the uh, shape of the bowl done then i epoxy filled the uh what amounted to a crack with dyed epoxy. And this was the shape, but you can also see that the rim is thin in some spots because of move, the rim really started moving. And I continued turning over a couple days. And to turn this, I used the, uh, <clears throat> the Jimmy Clues or Hunter ring tool, the, uh, the mate, because it, with that uh, six millimeter cup cutter, would handle the wood without catching too much and tear everything up. And this is the bottom here. This is sort of a salvage piece. I have one other. That ball was about 12 inches. This is 16. It's turned from white spruce. And uh, it's a fairly heavy platter, so you'd want to use it in your uh, I put in the uh, finger food area of a saloon, probably. But I used a, uh, a tenon, but I recessed the chuck 
So it's below the bottom of the bowl, but it forms a foot. White spruce is kind of tricky to turn because it's uh, got such a contrasting hardness in the summer wood and the winter wood. So it uh, makes a very fine touch, fine cuts, and fairly uh, frequent sharpening as you're doing, approaching your finished cuts. But that's it. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have Robert Elliott. Let me uh, spotlight your video. And you're on, Robert. What do you got? Got to unmute your mic. Yeah, I me. Mean, there. Yeah, I uh, had some wood given to me, and I, the wood that I enjoy, of course, because of the color and everything. And I know it's going to fade, and that's always been a problem. So what I did is that I, well, I just had a birthday, and my sister kept bugging me what I wanted, and I happened to mention airbrush. So I decided to wait. I got it. I haven't played with it yet, but one of the old tricks to make the color stay is use it as a pattern and airbrush it in. So that's what I'm going to be doing is learning how to use an airbrush and see if I can make the item stay. Uh, it was made for people that leave with disabilities because I got it off the side of the bark and it's easier for a person to hold a bowl if it's got a flat side to it. It won't tend to slip as much. It gives them something. So you, you put that in there. And I've worked with a lot of people with disabilities. I also, it's something I found in a dollar store years ago. And it was, I think I got ended up getting 30 or 40 of them for a, a $2 a piece. And then I, when I get bored, like lately, I've been making them and putting a handle on them as a back scratcher. And I give them away uh, to our local VFW. And then they pass them out to people they know when they visit hospitals and that. But that's what I've been up to for productive. Other than it's what I call playing on the lathe. Well, so I made 20 of them today. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's, no, I don't see any more hands up. So we're going to, oh, we got another hand up. Here comes Steve. What do you got, Steve? It is here. Uh, a little platter. I did the platter itself Steve, pretty simple. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Um, let's see. Terry, Terry Leafers, your your hand is up. I think I've got your pictures though, right? Um, let me cancel, Steve. Right. Uh, okay. Let me let me go with you because you're not the first pictures I have in order when I get you, but I'll get to you. Okay. Okay, Terry. Okay. Sounds Anybody good. Anybody else? Anybody else got anything before we go to the ones that I have? Pete has his hand raised too, Doug. Okay, um, I don't go ahead and uh, okay. There you go, Steve. So I had uh, about a half dozen uh, old uh, chef kits that I had never done anything with in the bottom of a box. So I, I made a half dozen pepper mills or salt mills. And then this was my challenge platter. Um, I'm not sure what I'll do on the outside. I think I will wind up doing some decorations on it. But on the reverse side, since I've gone into using a vacuum chuck, uh, I don't know if this will show, but I, I absolutely mimicked this on the under surface just to try and make it feel a little bit like um, it was a continuous uh, uh, line. Yeah. Yeah, very nice. Hey, on those pepper mills, do you find their instructions are really good or kind of half things are missing? Um, yeah, yeah, I think what I, I probably pulled about uh, five or six online um, uh, instructions. And the only thing that's really important is the depth of the, uh, the two uh, drills. The upper part has a seven eighths inch drill hole. The center is all one and a quarter all the way through. And before you, so I top drill halfway through, um, do a one and three quarters recess 
then a one and a half recess that is one and five sixteenths inch. It, it actually has to be exact. And then, then do the groove on the inside and then drill the rest of it through. And if you drilled it that way and done the recesses with those dimensions, it just pops right in and it, it locks in. Um, if you don't want to do it, if you don't have a way of, of doing the, the inner groove cut, um, you can cut them off of the mill and just glue the things in if you want. Um, that's another alternative. But since I, ha since I made uh, one of those Robert Sorby type um, groove cutters, that's what I use. Okay. I, I made one for Christmas last year. Somebody, my son asked for one. And when I got all done, the um, I think the uh, my shaft that goes through everything was longer than the project. Like I, yeah, need, yeah. I had to cut that shaft down. Is that pretty common? You got to cut that shaft yeah, down. Yeah, measure it, and you just cut it off, and you just sand okay. it down. It's okay. it's super easy. It's just aluminum, so you just snap it, cut. It's easy. Okay. Yeah, the instructions I have didn't say that. <laughs> it just said <laughs> and assemble, and I assembled, and everything was too long. Stop. Yeah, exactly. And I thought, okay. Uh, so I, I just kind of looked at it and figured it out and cut it down. And so, okay. All right. Maybe we have to have you do a demo on that sometime. Okay. I've also made it where you make the wood a little longer and then shave the wood to fit the staff. Okay. Um, okay. Let's. Uh, um, next up, we're going to go with. Uh, Let's see the ones I have. I don't see more hands up, so um, let me uh, let me turn on the ones I have. My hand is up. Oh, okay. Who's that? Jay. Okay, go ahead, Jay. So I just turned another. Uh, let's see if you can see this. I don't know if you can see it or not. Let's see if I can get the focus on it. There we go. I turned this uh, goblet this past week with a couple of uh, floating rings on it, and I ordered from uh, Germany a couple of hook tools and uh, use it for the hollowing for the end grain, and it worked great. So uh, I'll do a demonstration on that at some point in time. Um, they work beautifully. I also made this little shot glass for my daughter. She'd been asking me for a long time to make her a wood shot glass. So again, hollowed out with the hook tool. Took just a few minutes to make it, and it felt beautiful. You know? Cool. So. All right, anybody else have... Uh... Does anybody else have one they want to go before I turn on the ones I have on my computer? Okay, so here's the ones that um, um, here's the ones that I had on my computer. Um, Fred, can you? Well, no, yeah, can you spotlight this, Fred? I can't spotlight myself. Um, that way, uh, when um, are you there, Fred? Hopefully, Fred's there and can spotlight that. Um, this is the platter I made. What's that? You're up. Okay. I know, but it's not spotlighted. And, you uh, are. Okay, there we go. All right, there we Now we're spotlighted. Um, um, this was the platter I made after watching Matt's uh, demonstration last week. This is a piece of uh, English sycamore, quilted English sycamore that I got from, from Tony down at the jam. He's got a pallet of this. Um, it's highly figured. And uh, it has um, when you when you go th when you go through it, it's just it's beautiful wood. It's beautiful wood. Um, I dyed the outside of it with with uh, some yellow, blues, and and I think reds, if I remember right. Um, and then cut the center out, and then did my you know my black um, embellishment there with the piece of uh, laminate, you know, for uh, countertops. So using using. Uh, Matt Harbor's uh, suggestion from our last meeting. Um, there's another shot of it. It was just from a board, so it was only an inch thick to start with. Um, let's see, and this is another platter I made. That last one was about eight or nine inches. This one here is 12 inches um, from a piece of poplar I bought. Um, I did like a 3D effect uh, painting on there um, with an air with an airbrush. I bought a couple airbrushes and uh, and dabbled into that. So. Um, that is, uh, those are my like entries for the president's challenge. Whoever the president is, I don't know. Um, so next, uh, we have Jim Pearson. Are you there, Jim? I must be uh, unmuted. Yeah. Well, I hear you. So you must be unmuted. Go ahead and tell us about your piece. 
Okay, yes, uh, the, I made, made two. I started out, I uh, had some, uh, uh, a uh, board of uh, one by eight uh, yellow birch and I didn't use it for a project. So I thought, well, I'll just, because this is really kind of my, my, my uh, entry into this, I've got, I, I got a grand total. This is my, the two that I'm showing here, my sixth and seventh uh, uh, bowl and platter attempts here. And uh, the, the three pieces of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, three quarter inch uh, yellow birch, I cut them in sequence and kept the grain flowing in the right direction uh, and glued them together. I then uh, turned, uh, uh, turned it. It was ended up being a little thicker uh, for a platter than uh, so I just just went on and made a bowl out of it. Uh, on the back side, uh, I did the OG along the edge on that, and I used the the laminate that uh, method that uh, Matt had taught to uh, do the uh, uh, accent or wood burn the the rings and the bottom and the recess. Uh, when I took the uh, recess out, that turned out uh, to be about a quarter of an inch thick uh, between the bottom and the, and the recess. So uh, again, it started out as a practice piece that I just glued together and I brought it in and showed my wife and she just loved the, the ring layers and the way the OG felt, Matt was right on for that. And uh, uh, so she, she laid claim to that. <laughs> the second one I have here is the platter uh, challenge. This is uh, this turned out to be a lot more of a challenge than I than I had uh, originally intended. The uh, uh, platter that, I, that I'm looking at is the same the same board. I just uh, used two layers to give uh, about an inch and a quarter thickness. Uh, or excuse me, uh, it, uh, uh, three quarters, three quarters, inch and a half thickness, and the uh, uh, when I turned it, I got the face all turned, uh, and it was all textbook, uh, as Matt had, had shown. And I thought I'd dabble into wood burning. Uh, I certainly, I don't have any other accent tools. I, I, this is again, very new into doing this. So I went out and got a wood burning tool and, uh, uh, copied, uh, uh, uh a, uh, free piece off the internet, uh, for the, for the week. And, and burnt that. And overall, for my first attempt, I didn't think that was all too bad. And then I uh, mounted it in a Kohl's jaw. And uh, I, I, I've it's been having tough. enough success. It unmutes me. I've, I've been having enough success that I got, uh, I don't want to say unmuted now, hockey, but, but uh, um, uh, overconfident I guess would be a better word for it and uh, I hadn't had a catch in forever and sure enough after I started cleaning out where the where the recess was where the where the chuck mounted uh, I caught down in the, the section and it, and it uh, took it right off the coal jaws so uh, not having a way to to mount it uh, back in because the recess was uh, was already was already gone. Uh, I ended up uh, uh, finding I had already uh, I, when it was in the coal jaws I was I had already uh, 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 I mounted it back in the coal jaws, found the centers for the ring, and then uh, and then I centered it in uh, <coughs> to find uh, the middle of the bowl if you will just under the the J P there. And I uh, uh, mounted it with a jam chuck uh, back on the lathe. And I have a shop smith and I have a speed reducer for it. I took it down to about uh, 250 to 300 RPM because uh, it, well, it was, as you can imagine with the jam chuck there, it wasn't, I didn't have a high degree of confidence in, in its staying. And I shifted it back and forth till I finally got it pretty close to, to concentric. And uh, I was able to turn all the damage away. Every, almost every surface on this bowl, when it got through, uh, found some, some hard object in my shop and hit. <laughs> so I ended up having to, to turn away all the defects. Uh, and I was successfully able to do that. 
And uh, uh, I guess the, the, the best part about this whole bowl, although I, I'm, I'm not claiming it's beauty, but I will tell you, I did learn a lot with it. So <laughs> that's, and uh, uh, the finish on it was a, uh, the, that Ninwax uh, tongue oil finish, uh, white pine finish. And uh, I, I was very pleased uh, with uh, not necessarily the end result of the bowl, but what I ended up learning in the process of it. And so uh, it was kind of fun. All right. I um every I don't I don't like using cold jaws and I I use a lot of masking tape along with my cold jaw to hold things on. I I tape uh, the crap out of stuff. <laughs> I think so, I think uh, during our demonstration today, Bruce is also going to show a tip on how to keep things from flying out of your cold jaws because he's gonna I think he's starting out with some cold jaws today. So, oh I, excellent. I would say the same thing. I. I quit using my cold jaws after getting a vacuum chuck because it works so much better. Yeah, I, I would I would love to. Right now, my, my options are pretty limited. I have a I have a shopsmith that I'm turning on, and and uh, um, uh, the cold jaws offer me the ability to to work in with that shopsmith. And so for right now, until I until I get something that. Uh, that will allow a little more improvement. I, I'm kind of stuck with that, but uh, but the uh, like I said, it turned out to be a good a good learning process, and I definitely will be interested in in learning some additional safety tips with those cold jaws because, like I said, I, I this is my sixth. Well, this would have been my seventh turn, and every one of them I used a cold jaw. I didn't have a problem with it, and then like I said, just a, a minute, just a second of inattention, I I got a catch, and I definitely. I, I definitely learned its weakness. Hey, Jim, uh, there was a question on the chat board. Uh, can what, I interject here a second? Yeah, go ahead. I just want to say that there are some, some pretty decent aftermarket buttons available for the cold jaws that do work much, much better. And I think they're a lot safer than what comes with the jaws themselves. Oh, okay. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you. Yeah, and Jim on the on the chat board, somebody wants to know what model. Yeah, John McGee wants to know what model shopsmith are you turning with? Well, actually, it's my dad's. Uh, he bought in 1956. He bought a brand new shopsmith, uh, and I I have upgraded it, uh, and I got the shopsmith completely rebuilt it and upgraded it to a 510, and uh, um, and I got a speed reducer. I know. The, the minimum speed on a, on a shop Smith is 700 RPM. And uh, because of the lightness of the machine, uh, the speed reducer that you can purchase as a, an accessory for it is a must. You can pick those up on, uh, uh, you can pick those up on, uh, on eBay or uh, Craigslist uh, pretty regularly and, and for a reasonable price. Yeah, I know we have several members that use Shopsmith. I started with a Shopsmith. That was why I ended up turning because I bought a Shopsmith and it came with a set of turning tools. So when I got done with the project I bought it for, I broke out those the, the lathe tools that were in the box and and uh, it changed my life. <laughs> so. Well, I, I I I really enjoyed it. I took uh, I was fortunate enough my timing when I joined last uh, last year the club and uh, uh bruce came in and, and gave it uh uh gave an invitation to his basic class so I'll, I'll tell you if you uh if you're new starting out uh that basic class was worth its weight in gold and so uh i'm uh uh very pleased with uh what i learned in that and and i'm i'm enjoying being part of this just simply because of the comments and stuff that i'm getting here now i'm just uh, this is a growing experience for me so uh again appreciate it thank you all right my uh let's see the next person there's the last of jim's uh, pictures now i have uh jim jacaj sent me pictures he's unable to join our meeting um um if uh if anybody out there ever sees or talks to jim jacaj you need to convince him that it's okay to come to our meetings i Spent three days emailing him, and he, had, um, yeah, thinks it's you have to be a techie to do this. And I tried to explain it; it's a pretty simple process to get on Zoom. So, anyways, he sent me some pictures here. Um, he's got four marking gauges that he made. 
Um, um, there's one. The first one was Osage. This one's Coca-Bola. Um, this one's Jera. And the last one was African Blackwood. Um, he also sent me a picture of uh, this, uh, he, an illusion plate. It, I am, I'm, it's a segmented bottom, like the elk snodgrass, I'm guessing, is what he's done there. Um, this, the next thing I have is four awls that he made. Um, I think he said those are all Brazilian rosewood. Um, he also sent me this. It's a inverted, with inside out, turned back flow incense burner. So uh, if, I've seen videos of these, and you put a certain, uh, I don't know, I've never made one, but it takes a special incense that flows down and not up. So it'll like fill like a, flows like a river. So kind of kind of interesting thing. And the last thing he has here is a lamp, a mesquite lamp. And uh, that button down towards the bottom there, because it looks like he's got mesquite filled with turquoise, which is pretty popular if you go out, out to Arizona, where I think he goes for his winners. And then the button towards the bottom is the control. It's a touch control light. So let's see. Next up. I have Joe Spryce. Joe, are you there? I am. All right. What tell us about your piece? So this is a, a 12 inch or so diameter uh, platter that I made. It actually came from I I got a piece of mesquite, a big piece of mesquite, and this was a a leftover, if you will, or a scrap off of uh, the actual piece that I wanted to use, and uh, it sat around my shop for a long time, trying to figure out what to do with it and uh, decided to be a good candidate for the president's challenge. So as you can see, plenty of uh, imperfections. And then the second one, this is a piece of red bud I got a number of years ago and I had never turned red bud before and it sat in my shop for a long time. And um, I didn't realize that getting a piece of red bud that'll make a 12 inch platter was something to behold. And um, I wish now that for the person that sent it to me from North Carolina, a good friend, uh, I wish I had gotten about 30 more feet of it uh it's a dream to turn and it really really polishes up nice it's a beautiful wood to work with uh, not to mention a beautiful grain too and uh i i missed out on that one that's for sure so but those what are finish? my two entries to the president's what's challenge finish? what's the finish on that one joe uh it's actually white on poly okay very nice thanks okay next up we have John Petro. Are you in the room? I think I saw you earlier. John Petro, are you in the room? There you are. You need to unmute your mic, John. Are you still with us? I don't. He's not responding, so I don't know if he's in the room or not. Um, it's a mahogany platter. He did send me a description. Covered, colored with milk paint. Um, the internings include scallops on the back made with a bow gouge. Uh, he used a microplane to slightly bow or bow the edges and a one-eighth rotary plane for texturing on the front. So, um, yeah, so there's the front where he did his texturing on there. And, John, if you are in the room, you can unmute your mic and talk about this. Uh, let's go. I think you got, you got John. John is in the room. Can hey, you hear me? me? Yeah, there you are. Hey, tell uh, sorry, us. About guys. That's okay. Sorry, guys, having, having a little connection problems. Uh, this was uh, in response to the challenge. Uh, it's a mahogany with uh, milk paint, and the uh, lime in the milk paint, I understand, uh, helps uh, interacts with the wood and gives it sort of a um, bronze color. Uh, it's uh, the uh, the milk paint is uh, once it's dried, a couple coats is, is braided off with um, like Scotch Bright uh, pads of, of different uh, grit. I think this was uh, started with the brown heavy um, heavier grit and worked down to the the finer. So you can kind of adjust it, um, but it's all done with a, a a bowl gouge, um, and um, and the trick I learned uh, was to don't forget to texture the the 
uh, each edge of the pl the platter because it really kind of sets it off. And then um, uh, prior to that, uh, I bowed the the each of the edge slightly with one of those microplanes. So I think it turned out pretty well. It's very light, um, um, and I've, I've probably made about five or six of them uh, now. They're, they're just a lot of fun to turn. Uh, the, the back is done. It's kind of hard to see from that picture, but the back is sort of scalloped. And each one of those little ring um, is just made with the tip of, of the bowl gallon. So not a lot of tools, uh, very quick to turn, and, and very and, uh, and the paint is kind of fun to fun to play with. All right. All right. Very nice. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next up, we have Terry Leifers. Leifers. Terry, are you on now? Tell us about your pieces. We yes, I'm on. Um, Tell us about that birdbath. How'd you make that? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty hard on the tools. <laughs> the... Uh... The flower vase was Whoops, a hang on, of, hang on, let me go back. Uh, go the flower vase is a, some uh, red cedar I got from Tom Penninga. And uh, I just, uh, <clears throat> I, first, the first turning on that piece, uh, I tried to save as much of the, of the cedar as I could, but it turned out to be a pretty uh, ugly shape. So I trimmed it down a little bit and then, uh, yeah. Finished it with uh, regular polyurethane. Uh, haven't had much luck with the wipe on poly, especially uh, it skins over real quick, even in a small container. And then the last bit of the wipe on poly I had seemed like it, the whole bottle gelled up. So I, I went to just regular polyurethane and, two coats and it makes a really nice finish. And then the, the natural edge bowl, the only thing uh, unusual about that is uh, all of a sudden I found this piece of uh, cherry that was about three feet long and probably five inches diameter split right down the middle. And I had absolutely no recollection where I got that piece of wood from. Probably never happened to anybody else, but so I, the lesson from that I took is to um, label the, all the wood that I get so I know what, what it is and where I got it from. Okay. Um, that is all. I see a question popped up on the chat. It's from Tom. How did you get the texture on the top? You must have been talking about our last piece, Tom, that one? Yeah. Um. Yeah, John, are you in the room? Can you describe how you did the texture on the top? He might be here. I, I have in the notes here that he used the eighth inch rotary plane for the texturing on the front. So maybe a little rotary tool and I'll draw all those lines. I don't know. If he comes back, we'll go back to that. Okay, so that was Terry's. And let's see. Next up is Rick Havens. Rick, are you in the room, Rick? I know you have problems with volume. Sounds like somebody's trying to come online here. Rick Havens, are you? Uh, can you hear me, Rick? Are you still having issues? see him in the room he might have maybe he gave up with not being able to hear anything i don't know um this is a, a cherry vase that he turned it's nine and a half inches high and five inches wide so uh and i know he posted online and somebody wanted to buy it so congratulations um it's a nice little vase so if you come back on rick we'll back up and get to that uh next up I have Ron Vincent. Ron, are you in the room? I am. All right. Tell us about your piece, Ron. Uh, it's an 11-inch piece of mahogany. Started out an inch and three-quarter thick. That's the bottom of it. That's the top. Oh, I uh, right. was on YouTube, and I can't pronounce his last name. Stuart Bernini or something like that, an Englishman. Yep. Showed the spackle painting, in which, which is the other side on the front. 
and I used like six aerosol cans of paint, sprayed one after another over top of it. And then uh, he used newspaper, but I used a plastic grocery bag. He just blotted it so that all the colors actually come back out. And then, of course, I turned the center. Let's see, is the next picture the same one? That's the same one, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Now you can see it. Yeah. Um, yeah, the guy you uh, you're referring to, the um, Fury or whatever his name is, that's the video I watched to make my platter. He did that okay. ribbon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I watched him too. Um, and it was pretty good. I, he, uh, he has lots of videos out there on doing de uh, platters and different kinds of, of uh, paint, dyeing, and texturing. So, all right, very nice. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Uh, um, it, uh, I don't see anything else on here. Um, one thing I, let me go back and, uh, let me put me back on here. All right. Um, so that's our show and tell night. Very nice job on the show and tell people. Um, let's give everybody a big, a big applause. <laughs> um, Thank you. So um, um, I did have one question on there. People asked about, um, somebody asked if uh, able to access the supplies, our, our supply room. And our guild, we, we've discussed this at the last couple of meetings, and we're, we're just not real comfortable opening that up. And uh, um, we've uh, basically been encouraging people to go to Woodcraft, they uh, they need the business. They support our group by giving us um, gift certificates that we can give back out in exchange for that. Um, we'll probably discuss that uh, the supply room again at our next meeting. Um, we don't we don't know if there's enough demand for for someone to, to, to spend an afternoon down there. Um, we're we'll it'll probably get discussed again. But right now. We're just encouraging you to go to uh, Woodcraft and uh, and buy stuff there. I needed CA glue, and I was actually down at the jam. I could have grabbed a bottle, but I I just went to Woodcraft and bought one because uh, that's what we're encouraging people to do. And until that changes, um, that's that's where we're at with that. So um, I know that was one of the benefits of being a member, and we're trying to provide other benefits by uh, having some professional demonstrations that we're not charging for. Typically, we would charge people, you know, to 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 go to these demonstrations that we pay money for, and um, we've we're we're paying out, you know, twelve twelve hundred dollars and uh, or more, fifteen hundred dollars in in just demonstrators this year um, that we're not charging for. So um, we feel that's a huge benefit that um, kind of takes place of not being able to go down and and, and buy supplies. So. We encourage you to, to visit Woodcraft online or their store. Their store is open. Um, it's a huge, spacious store. It's easy to social distance in there, and, and uh, they're all wearing masks. I was there the other day. So um, that's that's our stance right now on supplies, and we'll we'll if it if it changes, we'll send out an email and let people know what we've uh, what we've changed that to. So, but right now, that's our stance. Um, so if we don't have anything else, did anybody else have any questions, business, or anything that we need to discuss before we go into our demonstration? Um, if not, then uh, we are going to move on to uh, to our demonstration with, uh, with Bruce. So, Bruce, you are on. Got to turn on your mic or something here. I don't hear you. I said, aren't I lucky? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, Jim was talking about um, his show and tell pieces. And I, the one thing I keep remembering, we have a club member that uses a shop smith. And he calls it the galloping Gertie. And he said the first thing he had to do is learn how to dance with it. <laughs> so... Um, I'm always picking on Jim about um, using a shopsmith, but he's really starting to turn out some nice stuff with it now. 
A um, couple things before I get started. I really appreciate and need to have questions and feedback. You know, one of the problems of um, doing these virtual demos, and I'm sure Doug can um, <clears throat> can chime in on this, but you're doing this and it's like you're talking to yourself and you're um, you don't you don't get any vibes on whether what you're showing uh, makes sense or reaches people and so I really would like to have you know even a oh wow is good and um, <clears throat> or uh, oh god that sucked whatever just hey, okay, I have a boy Bruce I have a, I have a, an idea. Uh, in the chat, is everybody everybody used to using the chats there? If you see Bruce make a mistake of some sort, chat oh, it. To thanks. Me. Yeah, chat that to me. Um, if you see him make a mistake, you know he forgot to put his mask down, or he he got a catch, or he dropped his tool, and chat that to me. And whoever chats the most mistakes that Bruce made, I'm going to give them a, a craft supply gift certificate. So. You, you can chat me in, in the chat, or you can just chat to everybody, I guess. But whoever posts the most chats on Bruce's mistakes will get a $10 gift certificate. So how's that for opening up the ice, Bruce? <laughs> so also, if I don't make a mistake, I get the gift certificate. Um, sure. Yeah, if you don't make a mistake, you get it. But I'm, I'm thinking somewhere along there, somebody's going to find a mistake and let me know you made a mistake. <laughs> Okay. So, so um, you know, we got started doing these stave bead boxes because um, back a couple years ago when we started doing the bead boxes, uh, everybody wanted to do them, but yet nobody was doing them. And we, Doug and I and a lot of other people, Ernie Conover, which is um, <clears throat> the fellow that taught me to turn my initial fundamentals, and he's also been a mentor to me over the years. All these people were like, well, what, what's going on? Why, why aren't they making them? And it really, we think it boiled down to the fact that um, you got to get a pretty good sized chunk of wood to hollow out for a bead box. And it's almost impossible to buy a kiln dried piece of wood that's big enough. A lot of people don't know how to glue them up if they were using multiple pieces like Jim did for his uh, handout for his show and tell. And um, and then then you got to know how to howl. And um, so we just kept scratching our head and we came up with this idea of doing the stave boxes. And the idea actually came from Charlie Funtas, who's a club member, and I see him. He's actually right above my head on my screen right now. Um, he did a demo on segmented turning, and in his uh, materials that he handed out was some statistics and sizes for staves, and that's where the idea really came from. So it's kind of a form of segmented turning. Um, uh, Ernie Conover got involved in this. Ernie Conover is uh, like super safety. If you can't do it safe, don't do it kind of thing. And um, I started talking to him about doing staves and he said, well, that's a great way to go. He said, the only thing is, he said, I'd be really worried about having um, something spinning in front of me that's just glued together on a, on a small edge and the whole piece is dependent on those glue joints. So if you had a weak glue joint or you got a horrific catch and it tore the joint open, um, next thing you know, you got a lot of pieces of wood flying at you. And so that led us to um, doing the um, staves with a, um, Let's try that camera. <clears throat> With a miter lock, 
so that the pieces go together and are physically bound together as well as glue. Plus the miter adds more glue surface. And so that's why I do and I make the staves for the boxes that uh, you folks want to use, if you want to use the staves, that are uh, done with a 22 and a half degree miter lock router bit. And so um, that's the reason for it. And what I want to do is I want to show some uh, some boxes. Uh, Got to go back to me. So this is one of the very first boxes I turned. I kept it. I held it back. I didn't give it to the hospital. And um, it's a stave. It's made out of pine. The base has a nice little knot in it. Um, but the reason I want to show this is there's two lid styles. And this one I call the inner lid because once you put it on, it doesn't extend past the box. And um, that's also going to be the box that we're going to make today. This is um, another one that's pretty early for me. And this one I refer to as the outer because the lid extends out beyond it. So what's the difference? The difference is I have to turn the lid totally separate from the box where the inner one that I just showed, I can turn the lid all at the same time. And that's why we're going to, I'm going to show that today. It, you know, it's just a, um, a design difference. Doesn't make a whole lot of difference which way you want to go. And then um, we started making, I don't know, it's that show? That show's pretty good. We started making uh, boxes, which we all loved, you know, because they were nice wood and nice finish. Uh, but then the realization came that we're making these for young people and uh, and their families. And so I started asking the box makers to um, do some enhancing, some ornamentating. And um, this one's made by uh, Nicholas Briggs up there in Grand Rapids. And um, he did a nice job. He's got a couple superheroes that he has put on with pyography. This one I don't really know, but I think the other one is uh, Wonder Woman. <clears throat> Here's um, one that somebody's painted up. Uh, I thought this was done by uh, Todd Beck down here in Kalamazoo, but it's not signed on the bottom, so I really can't give him credit for it because I'm unsure. Um, which brings me to the point that, you know, when you make these, sign them. You know, take some pride, put your name on it. Uh, I actually have a little slogan that I put on the bottom of mine. Um, in terms of slogans and messages, that you want to put on because you know these are going to uh, kids that are going through uh, cancer treatments and all. Uh, I would recommend, and I, it's your own personal preference, but I would recommend staying away from religious thoughts uh, just because you don't know what religious background this is going to go to and you don't want to offend anybody. But uh, uh, carrying notes. Uh, my friend down in San Antonio, when he makes a box, he actually drops his business card inside so that whoever gets the box, they know who made it. And he said he's actually had contact from some of the uh, patients thanking him for the boxes. This one was made by one of our club members here in Kalamazoo. Her name's Barb Buck. And uh, it's, a, it's a pine box. Uh, it would be pretty plain, uh, but yet she did some biography. And she made this really wonderful little carved 
cheese board with a hunk of cheese on top of it so that the mouse didn't get too hungry. I just thought it was kind of cute. Rick Havens turned this one in uh, just before the COVID uh, situation came upon us. And uh, these are my staves, and he's made a totally different kind of base than what I make, and also the lid. But one of the things I wanted to point out is he's enhanced this. These are just stickers that he's applied to it. Uh, they're nicely put on, and uh, it brings a little interest to a young person that maybe likes sports. So that's, um, that's something that... I thought I would show. Um, let's. Uh, what I want to do. Uh, Doug came down. Uh, we were going to do this demo live back in April, I think. And um, Doug came down and he did a photo. Hey, yes, sir. Go for it. Yeah, I've got a question about um, those um, the bead boxes um, and COVID. Is that is that put a Bit of a stymie on making those right now, or are or delivering those, or are you just collecting? It's, at this it's point? put a huge stymie on delivering them. Uh, the the people that I work with at Bronson Hospital are not accepting anything right now, so they're at the point now where um, the patients know they're going to eventually get a bead box, but there's no more boxes to give them. And I even talked to them about um, cleaning the boxes up, sterilizing, so to speak, and um, and uh, packaging them and sending them and shipping them in. And they didn't even want to do that. So they're staying away from receiving anything donated. And, um, you know, there's, there's thousands of people that donate to these hospitals, uh, things like knitted blankets, you know, for kids that are cold. And uh, it's just amazing how much stuff gets donated to the hospitals and they're not accepting anything right now. So um, what I'm doing is I'm just collecting them. I've got a bunch of them packed up and the day they say it's okay to bring them in, I'm gonna take them down so they're ready to go knowing that they're uh, building up quite a demand for these boxes because they're um, some of the children have got boxes that they're putting beads into and some of the newer children newer patient children uh, haven't got them yet and, but they know that the other patients have gotten these boxes and so they're all waiting for them does that answer your question Bruce, so the demand is still yeah, for there the most... even though we're not able to deliver. Correct. Very correct. Yeah, so, so keep making them. Keep making them. Oh, yeah, Charlie, you're right on. Keep making them. I mean, I'm collecting them at my house. And in fact, my family room is quite decorated by a lot of them, which I think is kind of neat. But um, as soon as um, they give us an okay, we're going to take them in. Uh, this uh, video that Doug did is about making the staves. We're not going to get into a huge uh, conversation about it, but it's worth uh, you seeing. I got it. I can uh, run this equipment. So what we're doing here is we've taken the boards and ripped them into stave widths, and now I'm running them through a planer to get them down to the size that the uh, router bits can work with. The router bits are only handle up to seven eighths of an inch thickness of uh, wood, and a lot of the wood comes in as rough sawn, which means it's like an inch and an inch and an eighth. And so you just have to make multiple passes to run the, um, the boards through the router. 
or I'm sorry, through the planer to uh, get them down to thickness. And since this video started right in the middle, for some reason, we're going to kind of back up once we get through it. Uh, these are these are the um, these are the router bits that I use. They're made by Fraud F R F R U D. I think it's spelled. Um, they're made to be run in a router on a router table. I use them on my shaper, which the shaper is just a big router table that's overgrown in horsepower and everything else. But one of the reasons that I use these, uh, these bits uh, cost me around $80 a set. If I was actually using shaper cutters, the cutters um, for wood that's thicker than uh, seven eighths, uh, the cheap ones start, sell for about $650 a set and they go up from there. So I use the router bits and one of the reasons is you really can't sharpen them. Once you start sharpening these bits, it changes the uh, profile in the, um, right here I got the mouse running over it. This profile will change as you sharpen it. And um, I was doing it for a while and I started noticing that the uh, staves when I put them together had little gaps around the uh, spline the, the actual lock piece. And uh, that was why, because sharpen them changes that profile. But Bruce, you were running hundreds of feet of boards, weren't you? Uh, I've run a lot of hundreds, yeah. <laughs> a lot of wood's gone across this, uh, this shaper making staves. Have you used the same bits the whole time? Have they lasted or do you have to replace them? I'm know? on my third set. They last quite a while. So here's... Um, I'm running a board across the uh, router bit right now by hand. This is the same way you would have done it on a um, on a um, router table. Uh, I stopped this action because I wanted to show uh, I use a power feeder, which gets my hands away from the spinning pieces and also uh, produces a, a more consistent profile on the board. But right here is where the wood is going across the uh, the router bit. And you can see that the wood's a little thicker on one side than it is on the other. And that's because the bit has shaved away a little bit of the wood uh, visible. That's what it looks like if you were to stick your head over. So that's the power feeder running the wood through. And uh, so there's the board after it's gone through um, one side of the profiling now on these there's a it's a two-sided situation so there's two bits to the uh, to the set whereas if i was doing a 45 degree lock miter i could use one bit to make both edges this one actually requires two uh, okay. here we go so this is, this is the wood where it comes in and I'm just measuring it to see how thick it is. See, it's like an inch and a sixteenth, which is too, too thick for the shaper bits. And then what I'm doing right here is I'm measuring the width of the board because these boards come in all different widths. And I'm trying to figure how wide a stave I can make to get the best use of the wood without a lot of waste and still be able to produce boxes that are in the uh, basic uh, size, which is like a six by six, so six inches in diameter and five to six inches in depth. So that's what I'm doing here. <clears throat> Let's 
And when I uh, when I rip these um, boards down to the thickness or the width of, for the staves, I'll actually end up with several groups. Uh, one group might be two and a half inches wide. Another group might be two and three eighths inches wide. Uh, I've even gone down to about two inches, which makes a rather small box, but just trying to get as much use as we can from the uh, <clears throat> from the wood. So what's the ideal width, Bruce? Two and a half? I use two and a half for the staves, yeah. That gives us that six inch diameter. So uh, Benjamin Truss has a question. Yes, sir. Go for it. Um, Larry's question is, are all power feeders that large? Uh, maybe not. Uh, this, that power feeder, that particular power feeder is a professional model. It's uh, what they call a four wheel power feeder and um, they do make some three wheel ones that are a little shorter and also a little more narrow. And then some other makers have smaller uh, power feeders than that, but that's a, uh, a powermatic piece of equipment. So what I'm doing here is I'm getting ready to run the boards before I rip the staves out across the joiner. And the reason for going across the joiner is it does two things. It makes the small edge of the board perpendicular to the large edge. So I'm squaring up the board, but I'm also flattening out. A lot of the rough sawn lumber comes in. It's got little whoop de doos in it that um, if I used it just the way it was, it wouldn't produce a, a stave that would actually go together well. So in flat woodworking, if, especially if you're using um, rough sawn lumber, this is almost the very first step with any of the wood to uh, prep it to go to the saw or whatever the next movement is going to be. So I've done that. And now I've set my uh, rip guide and I'm starting to rip the uh, staves into size. This is where we started, where I'm taking the uh, boards and I'm running through the planer to get them uh, thinner so that they'll work on the uh, router bits. So that's the uh, prep process for the staves. And then the next thing is to uh, take them to the chop saw and cut them to length. And again, um, I'll vary the length based on how much wood I have, you know, these are roughly six inches. Sometimes I can go six and a half, seven, um, or sometimes I got to go sh shorter. I think the shortest I do is five. And then um, let me switch the cameras here. <clears throat> this is um, what they look like when we're done prepping them. You got, you got the spline on one side and then the mating piece on the other side and they just go together like that. Uh, one of the lovely things about uh, using the lock miter is when you go to glue this up, that physical lock keeps the pieces from sliding apart. If you've ever glued up a, like a picture frame with mitered corners, you know how much those want to slide around on that nice slippery wet glue. And um, the lock takes care of that. And I'll show you that in a minute. But Bruce, the next the, step, yeah, go for it. Bruce, the, uh, you're actually uh, milling the wood square and the router bit is actually introducing the appropriate angle, correct? 
Absolutely. So when this went into the shaper, it was square, and the shaper cut the miter and also the lock uh, spline, spline and mating piece. Well, they're doing it one pass, Bruce? I want two passes, one for each side. So this is one, this is cut by one of the uh, router bits, and then I have to change the router bit to produce this side. So it's a set of two. And that, and that produces an eight-sided vessel, right? You, yes. You have, because you could get different degrees to, to make like a six-sided, a hexagon? They, they, they don't make a lot. They don't make a lot of uh, lock miter um, router bits. Pretty much uh, all you can find is uh, 45 degree, which gives you a four sided piece. So that would be a box. And um, and the 22 and a half degree, which gives you the eight sided piece so that we can turn into a, a round. Yeah. You see, get, they posted. Get, in the chat, they did post a, a link to Freud Tools to get the that lock bit. So if Good. anybody's interested. Good. So. And there's there's lots of other manufacturers that make those bits, and some are less money, some are more money. I just try to stay with the Freud because uh, I feel their products are uh, priced right, and they're um, really well built and and they last a long time. All my saw blades are Freud, and all, most of my router bits are Freud. Bosch is another uh, fine manufacturer of router bits. So when you um, start getting ready to glue these up, the first thing you have to do, and I want to get this, I don't know how well that shows. Let's try this side. I don't know if you can see little fuzzies on the edges of this. Uh, there's some right along this top side. There's also some right in here. I don't know how well that's showing. Doug, tell me how it's showing up. Um, um, I can see. Yeah, I can see the cut edges, the, the, the little shavings, pieces, fuzzy edge. So you, what you need to do is you've got to sand those fuzzies off because if the fuzzies get in there, they get in between the two parts of the lock miter, they'll actually hold the joint apart a little bit. And that shows up in your final turning as well as it also gives you a weaker uh, glue joint. So what I do, I use a, a sponge to, uh, it's a sponge sander. And I just take and stroke those areas and get those fuzzies off. It doesn't really matter so much along this edge, but along the lock and along, see now there's, um, this was cut with a, uh, with a bit that was starting to get dull and it's left, sorry about that. It's left some fuzzies along the spline itself. And so I just take and stroke those off. Let me take some minute. And um, I go through all the staves doing each one. Then um, I'll talk about the glue in a minute. But then I take a uh, paintbrush and I start painting glue on. And um, this is not like fine furniture. Um, squeeze out is actually, in my opinion, is a good thing because it means you had enough glue in the joint to fill it. Um, so I really slop on a lot of glue and the excess of squeeze out and all is going to get turned away when we put it on the lathe. So I don't worry about it at all. So I'll paint this up with the glue and on my workbench, not on my lathe. Unfortunately, I have to show it on the lathe. Um, I just stick it on a piece of wide tape and I bring the next one in and and physically put them together. And I just uh, go through that whole process of slopping glue on and then sticking them down. And I'll show you why I'm doing this. If anybody's ever made a box before, they know this trick. Hey, 
I didn't figure you, that you really needed to um, watch me uh, paint glue on all of these. One of the things when I deal with glue, I seem to get it all over me. So I've pressed these onto that tape. And then all I have to do is take and roll this up. And put it together. Bring the tape around that last joint. And there's my my basic box with all its glue running out of it. I'm going to stick me down in the corner there. And then um, I take and put a band and these are just um, um, I think they call them worm clamps. They use them for heating and air conditioning and hoses on cars. And you can get them all kinds of sizes. I buy these at Lowe's and a package of six for about $12. And so I just put this clamp on. And I, what I do is I position the worm right at a corner. And the reason for that is, uh, as this clamp tightens up, if I was on a flat, I don't have enough room to uh, use my uh, impact driver. And it brings it tight, just like that. Nothing slips. I turn it over, put another one on the other side, same thing. Put it at a corner joint, tighten it up. And I let it sit for uh, 24 hours. So the glue I use is this tight bond translucent. Um, Tight bonds got lots of great glue. They'll all work. Um, but what I found is most of the um, the uh, tight bond line of glues, when it dries, it's uh, somewhat brown. Uh, the tight bond three, which I use a lot for um, exterior projects, uh, gets um, quite dark brown. And this translucent. Uh, stays pretty clear when it dries and therefore it makes it harder to um, see the glue joint once uh, once you've turned the box. And I just leave the masking tape on. Uh, eventually it comes off when um, when I start turning the box. So that's that's how I do the glue up. And these are the uh, clamps that I get. Is that upside down or right side up for you guys? Everything's upside down. Sorry about that, Jane. Somebody's been there you posting. go. Yeah, somebody's already got a couple of check marks for the things you've posted upside down. Oh, no. Does that mean I don't get the certificate? <laughs> you get the certificate. You've already made mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the clamps. And again, this is the glue, so you can see it right side up. Um, and these clamps, I don't know, I've, I've done lots and lots of boxes. We, uh, I teach, uh, uh, staved bead box workshops and we've used these clamps quite a few times and they last pretty good. The only thing is if you're using an impact driver, like I'm doing, you can't overdrive the, the worm and, uh, rip the clamp up. You just give me a second to get some organizing done here. Are there any questions yet? Um, 
Nope. Not that I see. So, um, let me try the side view. Let's give some nice detail. This is kind of what it looks like. There's little knobs of glue on here. And um, down the side, you can see where the squeeze out has left lumps of glue. I just don't worry about them. Uh, this is not like making fine furniture. That kind of squeeze out, if you were making furniture, is a disaster. But in this process, it's fine. So the first thing you need to do is flatten the edges of the blank. I'm, from now on, I'm going to call this a blank and not a box. And the way I do that, and I will talk about um, the um, cold jaws in several different formats. So just bear with me for a little bit. <clears throat> this is um, this cold jaw is actually made by um, the easy tool people, and they call it the easy chuck. And one of the reasons I, I have uh, easy chucks that I like a lot because it's really easy to change the jaws. And they make um, these, they make these long pins that seem to hold these blanks quite well. So I have a question about the easy chucks. Didn't go for it. Uh, when you change those jaws, do you feel they go in as accurately as the jaws like on a regular, like a vet mark where you have to screw them on? When yes. They, 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 they fit in there accurately every time. They lock down um, accurately, just like a Vic Mark, or um, I use Stronghold chucks a lot. And uh, they're the same thing, you gotta screw the jaws on. Um, so if you're, if you're doing uh, turning where you need a lot of different jaw sizes, you could actually get away with having one chuck and the, and the different size jaws and change them out rapidly. It, it literally takes about 30 seconds to change from one set of jaws to another. And I, I can display that uh, once we uh, get done with this. I will tell you that um, my friend Ernie Conover won't use the easy, jaw, easy chucks because he's concern that the latching mechanism is um, could could fail and that would let the jaw loose. I don't know, I've used them for quite a few years and I've never had any trouble. So the first thing... I have a question. Ron Campbell, don't you have an issue with those? Are you still in the room, Ron? Ron, are you in the room? Did we lose Ron? Yeah, he didn't want to learn how to make a bead box. It's too easy. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. So the first thing you want to do is you want to make sure that this edge and the other edge are totally flat. That's the first, first step. And um, it's a pretty easy thing to do. I just I want to make sure I get that chuck tight. I'm talking and uh, my mind only has one track to run on. Yeah, I got it tight. I do want to say that these these pins on the on the easy chuck, any of the chuck uh, chucks where you're using long pins like this, you can over tighten them and actually bend the shaft inside the the gripper. So you have to be a little bit more conscious about how much force you're putting on the, on the chuck when you lock them up. Hey, Bruce. Yes, sir. A question. You didn't, I mean, you obviously didn't um, face the uh, side that's against the chucks now. 
Is that correct? Are you just kind of letting the pins do the aligning to the axis of the lathe? Uh, the only, the really only important? thing to, that I did to align them is I made sure the blank got pushed up against the jaws solidly and then um, and then tightened up on it. The fact that this is a, a wide piece, it's kind of hard to get it cocked in there if you if you just settle it against the uh, face of the jaws. Does that answer? So it may only have two, it may only have one or two points of contact on the surface of the jaw, but the pins are doing the aligning, correct? Right. So this is um, not unlike the process I went through with the joiner and the planer in prepping the wood in the sense of you got it, you're starting with something that I call raw and you're milling it and perfecting it. And so you have to deal with that uh, as a possibility. But what I'm going to show you will alleviate all the problems that any deviation and how this blank is locked up uh, can be taken care of. So now we get to do what uh, all of us turners like to do, and that is uh, make some dust and some chips. And I started out fairly slow. And all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a cut across the end of the box to flatten it up. You're cutting air when you first start because of the points of the box. So it's a scraping cut. Once you get a shoulder that you can put the uh, bevel on, you can open the gouge up. By the way, I'm using a uh, bowl gouge and it has the uh, David Ellsworth grind on it to do that. Now I know I'm not good enough to uh, actually get a perfectly flat cut on there. I know Doug and some of you other experienced turners can do that. That's not bad. You put the uh, top camera on. It's really not bad. I'm proud of myself. That should uh, negate some of those uh, mistakes I've made so far. But what I do is I, um, I started out just using a board and uh, because I'd make enough boxes that I needed a tool, I made a, something that's a little easier to hang on to, but if you take a board, the sandpaper, and put it across and sand, it's, um, it will perfectly flatten that edge. It's impossible to have an angle on your wood any way, shape, or form because the board is all the way across the piece and it self flattens. So, I turn the speed down. And it will dance around a little bit. Now I see I still got I got some marks right there that I want to get rid of. That's where I made my entry cuts. Here we go. <clears throat> I just take and turn this piece around.
What I try to do, let's see, where are we? <clears throat> right here. The, um, if you look at the point of the box, I try to get those points into the center of the groove between the jaws. And what that does is that gets these pins almost in center, depending on the size of the piece you're turning. But with these six inch boxes, it almost gets the pins perfectly in center of each stave. <clears throat> We're going to do the same thing. Uh, I'll give you a down view on this one. I try to do to do a, a scraping cut for my entry cut is I'll line the bevel up in the direction I want to go, which should be parallel to the surface, the end surface, and I flatten it out like I was going to do a scrape. I get up close, and then I roll the tool open. And the reason for that process of um, starting out in a scraping mode and then as you start penetrating the wood, <clears throat> rolling it open, what you've done is you've taken a very small scrape and gotten a surface for the bevel of the tool to be on and then you can open it up and let the uh, gouge do its job. Um, but the benefit of that is if I tried to come in this way, there's a good chance that if I'm not perfectly straight with the bevel, that the gouge is going to uh, take a screw action and go across the surface some. And so by rolling into the cut, that does away with most that chance. You probably want a really light cut on that too, so you don't like... Yeah. That right yeah, out. I'm taking... I'm taking as light a cut as I need. Um, some some of the boxes I've glued up have been really bad. And so then I've got to take a deep cut. And the other thing is, if it's pretty good, you don't have to cut with a gouge. You could just take your sandpaper and flatten it out. The problem that I find is, is that those little nodules of glue will plug the sandpaper up really fast. See, I've used the scraper to do that end piece. And that's a good point, Doug. Uh, you can use a lot of different tools. I'm just showing the way I do it. Uh, a lot of it has to do with what are you comfortable with. So at this point, um, we're we're um, we're ready to um, start the hollowing process. I'm trying to look at my notes to see if I covered everything I want to there. How about, how about if we didn't have full jaws? How would you get this far? Well, uh, Doug, let me, um, let me do this first hollowing and then I'm going to go into all that. Okay. 
but since I've got this mounted, I'd like to um, I'd like to do that process. So like this this is um, a robust comfort rest, steady or tool rest. And um, it's too big for me to get in the right position to get in the right position so that I can cut on center with my tool and clear the bottom. So it's dragging right there. And so that means what I got to do is just kind of put the corner in. Oop, I'm still hitting. Just put the corner in like that. And the problem with doing that is I don't have a lot of support. My tool's going to start hanging out over the rest a long ways, and it's going to produce a lot of chatter and a not very good cut. Uh, I am going to go ahead and do that on one cut just so you can see what I'm talking about, and then I'll show you some other ways. Now, I'm going to use a, um, a detail gouge, and I'm using it as a scraper, whereas I'm using the wing as a scraper, and I'm doing a pull cut. I would not recommend pushing the tool in. And you really can't ride the bevel, whether you're using a bowl gouge or a detail gouge or whatever. You really can't ride the bevel because you're you would be doing um, quite an intermediate or um, interrupted cut, and it would be difficult to uh, control the cut. So uh, the reason I say I'm using a detail gouge because uh, a lot of people don't know that you can hollow with one. Uh, another tool that really works quite well is a scraper here. And I'll I'll do that in a minute. So we got a we got a pretty good. It's a little better. Pretty good view. I got to kind of stay out of my way here so I can uh, show you what's going on. So I take the tool in and I want to just present this this edge, this wing to the wood, and I'm only going in halfway. So I actually hollow these in a two-step process. I'll do half of it, and then later on I'll do the other half, and I'll show you why. Well, that's a pretty good example of the noise rate you're going to get. You uh, move, it, it, go ahead. Can you camera to your left a little bit? Get that the camera more to the left. We couldn't. Your hand was in the way. It was. I'm sorry. You move that to the left. Yeah. So you want to go that well, way. Other way. Yeah. Yeah. Get the no the other way. You had it. Yeah. Get it over that way. That way we can see beyond your hand. Yeah. Like that. There you go. Now we'll be All right. So let me uh, let me change over here because I don't really like doing it that way. I see Fred posted that the AZ little hogger works great to rough out uh, one of those also. Which... All right, that's uh, I'm glad you did that because I I've not tried the little hogger. Um, this is a tool rest. Let me see if I can give you a better view. Probably me. This is a tool rest. It's uh, manufactured by Robust. It's called a box rest. Um, I don't know if the price is still the same, but they were 55 bucks when I bought it. And I bought it to do to do in these bead boxes, but I end up using this a lot, and I'll show you why. Uh, it's designed to go in 
inside your box like that and you can literally bring your tool right on around and go across the face if you want to. I'm, I don't do that, but that's what that design is for. But the idea of it is, is it gives you very solid tool support deep inside of your, your box. So I'm, I'm switching over. I got to move my uh, tail rest. It's in the way. I'm switching over and I'm going to use a, um, an inside bowl scraper. This happens to be a Glenn Lucas uh, negative rake. And I sharpen these uh, at a 25 degree angle. So I have a 50 degree inclusive angle right at the point. Um, Stuart Batty says, uh, negative rake is um, productive and safe as long as that inclusive angle stays at 60 or below. So I'm using a 50 degree. Uh, but as you can see, the whole scraper is supported by the tool rest. So um, if you got an extra 55 hours that you want to spend uh, it's a great investment. Otherwise, uh, you have to deal with uh, sliding your tool rest down in and getting the best support you can get. So I don't want to I don't want to waste away too much wood. So what I'm trying to do is get down to the point where um, the glue and the joint disappears, and that's where I stop. bit more. I don't know if you're cognizant of it or not, but you can go by the sound to know when you've gotten gotten round. Robust tool rest is still selling for 55 bucks. Is it? That's great. I mean, it's a it's a marvelous tool. I use or a rest. I use it a lot. Well, 
I see you've turned at about halfway in. Are you concerned with, uh, with the inside edge being parallel, that you're not at an angle there? You Here, you, you're talking about, Doug? Oh, inside, long. inside are you are you concerned that you might be thinner towards the the very you're at the, at the bottom here that you're that the, the edge of the of the box might be thinner at the bottom than towards the middle where you've stopped cutting are you worried about that being parallel perpendicular I'm really not um, there's two things that are going on I mean it's the inside of a bead box so uh, unfortunately the production person in me says um, Keep in mind what the end use of this is. And um, so I'm not terribly concerned about it, but I'm also using the tool rest because this is the tool rest that I use and visually eyeing the gap. And unfortunately, I can't show you that gap. Um, but I eye that as a guide to know whether I'm parallel with the outside or not. Uh, then the trick becomes you want, because you're going to put a tenon, you're, it's like any other box, you're going to put a base on, or this is like making a lid for a box, except it's going to be the base. You want this edge to be uh, not on a bias. And so I just, uh, I use a tool like this square and slide it in there. And uh, I did pretty good at getting that straight. So I'm happy with that. If I didn't, I'd have to go back in and just work on it some more and, um, and uh, <coughs> try to get it squared up. Because if the inside of the box is on a bias, when you go to put fit your tenon for the base in there, you start having trouble. <laughs> you either got to cut the tenon on the same bias, or if you got a square tenon, you're going to end up with a gap someplace. <laughs> Excuse me, the dust is uh, getting to me. I'm used to turning with a with a powered respirator helmet, <laughs> so. I'm not used to the dust. In fact, I'm going to turn up my filter fan now. And since since this is the uh, bottom of the box, I take advantage of the fact that the bottom's open and I sand it. So that I don't have to try to sand deep inside the box when I'm finishing it. And um, this is my go-to tool for uh, sanding inside the box. It's a piece of, uh, I think, inch and a quarter PVC pipe with um, some rubber pipe insulation taped onto it to give a little uh, softness to it. And then... Um, I wrap some sandpaper around it because I don't, I'm not the kind of guy that's going to take a piece of sandpaper on my hand and put my hand in there. It just um, makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up when I even think about doing that. I find when sanding the bottom of those, I can get in there with my angle drill and get that bottom two inches. Oh, okay, can you? Yeah. Oh. With a two inch, with a two inch uh, mandrel on there.
Well, that's good enough for what I'm doing today. So now the next step would be to make the base, but I want to take a few minutes and um, talk about some alternate ways to mount these blanks when you don't have cold jaws or you don't have long pins for your cold jaws. And um, this is one of the questions that has come up time and time again. Uh, Doug, to answer your question about the jaws, these, all you gotta do is stick a pin in here and push and that releases the latch. It comes oh. off. So that's what the back of it looks like. And the latch actually catches See if I can get the right angle for you. There's a lip in this depression right there. And that's what this catches into to hold the jaw on. Those, are, are those numbered? No, they aren't. That's nice. Um, yeah. yeah, you can just pile them up. So that's how easy it is to change over. So if I only had one chuck, the next thing I was gonna do is make my base. I would need some regular uh, dovetail jaws. I can just pop these off, pop the jaws on, and I'm ready to go. So what I have here is a waste block with a faceplate on it, or a, fa a faceplate with a waste block on it, no matter how you want to think about it. I have used this before, mostly for demo, I think, for either the Grand Rapids Club or the Kalamazoo Club. And so what I want to do is I want to make a tenon that'll fit the inside of the box, just as it is. So well, this is an alternate way to hold these. And I know some of the uh, fellows in Grand Rapids have done this to uh, make their boxes. And my tenant's just a little large for this one. So we'll, we'll turn it down. Now I'm gonna do the same cut that I did previously. Where I'm gonna take the tool, I'm gonna to start out making a scraping cut, and then I'm going to, let's see, let's get top. Where are we? There we go. So I'm gonna start out making a scraping cut, and then I'm gonna roll the tool open as, as soon as I get an edge there for the bevel of the tool to ride on, and at that point, it will be a scrape or a push cut from that point on. <laughs> mm -hmm. A little big. Get, getting really close to it. Now 
I'm going to use a flat scraper that I have sharpened to be a negative break. And this is okay if it's a little loose. You know, what the tenon is there for is a lock, so the piece can't fly off laterally, and it also centers it up. So at this point, um, what you want to do is make sure you have a nice flat. And if you see, if you're looking down on it, you can see I've got a gap in here. You don't want that gap which means I'm not flat right at the shoulder. So I'm using a, um, a box scraper so that I can have the side cut. There we go. So at this point, you could glue this drive plate, waste block drive plate on to the bottom of the box. And once that's cured, that would be your, um, that would be your drive or your coal jaw replacement. So that's one way to go. And I know, um, a couple of the uh, fellows up in Grand Rapids have done this. Another thing you could do with the same drive I got to clear the deck here so bear with me a second. Too much stuff out. Are there any questions so far? If ands, buts, likes, dislikes. Yeah, I, I don't know if I misunderstood. Do you say you're gluing that to the box? Exactly. So what I, we're what we're talking about here is you know i get the question every time i do this demo someplace i get the question well i don't have cold jaws how can i turn that box and do the hollowing and um so what i'm doing is i'm showing one two three i got four different ways you can drive this box without cold jaws well three without one with cold jaws, but with just the regular uh, buttons on it. So you make a tenon with a flat that'll match up to the flat of the box and you glue it on. So at that point, now you could drive the box and do your hollowing. Which that okay. your fingers at the bottom of it then though. People don't, you didn't glue your bottom on, you glued on a waste block, right? So right. Now right. This is this is not the bottom of the box. If you uh, okay. if this was the bottom of your box, that means you've got a hollow all the way to the bottom, and that's more challenging than just partially hollowing from each end. I mean, it can be done. Yeah. Got it. Are you? Um, might have a hexagonal shape at the bottom of your uh, bead box. On the inside. Yeah, and we've actually had some of the boxes come in from Grand Rapids where inside they were still hexagonal. No and that's, a, you know, that's okay. All right, I got some room now. 
So would you glue that waste back on there like with a lot of glue or just like yeah some? yeah just slap of... it on okay. and then uh, at some point you're going to actually uh, use a parting tool and part it off okay. you need to turn off mini me so we can see what you're doing there you'll get lonely though oh you will we don't care Uh, let's see, where can I show this? But <coughs> so this is a, an adaptation I've made for one of my live centers. It's just a piece of uh, two by six or whatever it was. And I drilled a hole in it and I threaded it so that I can put it on my live center and I've also turned an angle on it to fit inside the boxes. And this is a really handy tool if you're gonna do more than one box. It's handy even with one, but if you're doing multiples, it's really great. And so what I do with this is I just take and put that on in that format. I'm gonna cut my head off a little bit in that format and what that does is that holds that on for me so um when i glue up a box this is the thing that i use to clamp the box on either to this waste block or onto uh, my base or whatever so you could have glued that put it together and let it sit in your well in this case an eight thousand dollar clamp overnight or an hour or two and uh, it would be the same as if you'd taken a bunch of clamps and tried to lock it up. So the other way to go is to um, actually screw that on. That was your chance to have a pee break. Oh, and I missed it. Yeah. Um, so what I do is I drill a pilot hole. Where are we? Um, there we go. I drill a pilot hole in here. You can feel when you go through. I'm only going to do a couple screws for the sake of time. So I put four screws in. So one, skip that one. Yeah. I'm using uh, these uh, Craig pocket hole screws, and the reason that I like to use these is the shank is quite small. The shank is quite small, and they're self-tapping. So when I drilled these holes, all I did is I went through the, the blank, the body of the box, the workpiece, to loop to um, to have space for the drill bit, and then I just run that screw in there. It doesn't have to be reeved down. What you're doing is you're just putting a 
a locking device in so that you can turn the box. This is if you didn't want to drill it. I mean, if you didn't want to glue it. If you didn't want to grill, glue it, right. So what do you do about the holes when you're, when you're ready to take it off of here? Um, you could put more holes in and glue beads in. Um, one of the fellows actually did this from Grand Rapids and he had a, a bigger, he must have used a bigger screw and he was out further than what I am. And he, um, he affixed marbles in those holes. So you can use it as part of your uh, enhancing. But I do that, or that's a recommendation. I don't do it because I've got all the other equipment. But now you can drive the box without a cold jaws. So that's two ways. Glue it on, screw it on. If you screwed it on, you could reuse that block then for your next one. Many times, yeah. Where the glue wouldn't work so good. Okay, so before I get to the uh, cold jaws, go back to cold jaws. So this is um, called a donut chuck. And um, you make them for to hold things that are just, you can't hold any other way. Um, Doc Green published a wonderful book, Fixtures and Chucks for Wood Turning. And the process to make a donut chuck is in this book along with hundreds of other ways to um, mount and safely turn different pieces of wood. So if you don't have in the, this in your library, I highly recommend it. But in this book, is a complete instructions to make this. Now I've never turned a bead box using a donut chuck, but I've made this because it's a fine example of how to hold that box and drive it so you can hollow it on the, so you can hollow it. And you see, I've cut it back far enough that I can hollow the wood out, bring it round inside and still have clearance to the chuck itself. Um, there's there's some real pros and cons to these uh, donut chucks. One is these screws need to only be exposed at the headstock. You don't ever want to have anything protruding out on the operator side of the of the chuck because you don't want to take a chance of becoming entangled or even just scraping your hands up bad by the uh, screws flopping around. So that's a negative to it. Um, now I've left these long because when I made this chuck, I thought, well, I'll leave them long because I might want to use it someday for something. Um, but if you were making one of these just strictly to turn bead boxes, then what I would do is I'd cut them off pretty short. But you still have this wing nut here that's rotating, so you have to be more cognizant of it. And I'll take one of these. Hopefully I can turn this. Yeah. See, now I've just let that screw protrude from the um, from the nut 
and you don't even want to have something like that out there because uh, if you're one of these guys that uses gloves when you're turning, your glove could get caught, your shirt sleeve could get caught, a whole lot of things that could entangle you in the lathe. So that's really one of the, the downsides of using a donut chuck. But they're effective, uh, they're very positive, and they're an excellent way to turn something that you can't get a hold of any other way. And, and then up. Doc Green's, go ahead, Doug. Um, if I was, and I've done something similar to this, I can't remember now what it was, but um, where I had some protruding off the backside like that, and I put a piece of tape around that, like loosely, so the tape was yeah. just, and then that swings around, and if you get close to that while it's turning, that tape will hit you before the, the book Yeah. Threat. I do that with rubber bands on weird stuff. Yeah, stick, stick something on there that's flying around the outside, and it'll warn you when you're getting close. You're better off get hit by a piece of masking tape than, than by the boat. This is the uh, last uh, alternate mounting. Um, so. This is a standard cold jaw. This one's actually uh, a one-way stronghold chuck with the uh, stronghold, and they call this the Mega Max uh, jaws. They don't call them cold jaws. And um, like most of the cold jaws, they come with a bumper or a gripper that's on a dovetail, it's on an angle. And um, uh, Jim Pierce, this might be an answer to what you were dealing with. So you tighten up on these and because of the configuration, that dovetail angle on the bumpers, you get contact and it's human nature to start tightening these up. Now I want to get a, maybe that view will give me what I want. You start tightening these up and what happens is the bottom edge of the bumper starts to swell because it's hitting the wood first. And so it starts swelling away from the chuck jaw. And when it does that, it takes your blank and moves it away from the jaw face. And you can't hold it back if you do that. So I don't know if you can see where that's swollen out there or not. Let's try the side view. Probably can't see it. But where they flatten on the wood, they swell away from the jaw and they will literally push the work away from the flat of the jaw face. And if you had something like this um, live center yeah, you can hold it back with that and get that back down on the face. But the problem is, is you want to hollow inside that bowl and you can't have this in there. <clears throat> so there is a uh, excellent, excellent way to deal with that. And um, I'm going to put that in there. Where are we? Let's go top. What I've done is I've measured how high these bumpers are. They're a uh, half inch. And on this blank, I've put a line on every flat that's a half inch. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this blank and I'm going to cut a dovetail into that that will match up with the dovetail on these bumpers. So I'll do that now.
you can use um, you can use any uh, any of your gouges. I'm have I'm actually using a uh, forty forty grind on this bowl gouge to do this. And we want to go. Where do we want to go? Side. Nah, top. Top. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start right at that line and cut towards the bottom of the box. I've got enough lines on there that I can see that as they come down. Again, you have a number and cut there in the beginning. I'm rolling the tool open. And I'm just pushing it in the direction of the bubble screen. And you wanna you wanna just go in as deep as the flat. Now I went a little deeper, I've got a a crease in there. It's not very deep at all. But all this will come out when you turn the outside of the box. This will all go away. And um, I'm actually going to go a little bit deeper. I want a little bit more bite. I do that. I have. I do that, and I have a pair of jaws that are big enough on a chuck to grab that. So the same same thing, though. Well, there's a lot of people that I know only have one chuck. Yeah. All right. So what I'm doing now is I'm tightening the uh, cold jaws up with the standard bumpers and that dovetail is fitting right inside of that dovetail that I just cut. And that box is on there. I could go a little tighter. So Bruce, the it looks like you're uh, pushing the, the pads away from the center of the flat a little bit to get into a little bit more of your recess. Well, uh, the, the dynamics of the box and the jaws are not going to let me align these uh, bumpers up into the deepest part of the cut. See, so these two could, that one might, yeah, might be able to, let's see. See if I can get that. Maybe my jaws wouldn't open far enough too. There we go. Yep, there we go. Good point. That was David, right? Yes. yes. So that's locked in there, and the bumpers have actually pulled the blank up against the flat of the jaw. So it's solid. I would I would say that's almost safer in terms of turning than using the long bumpers. So that's a, that's an alternative if you have um, a set of cold draws, but you don't have the long pins. Any questions? Hey, Bruce, I've made some long pins with just longer bolts and using some hose material. Yeah. Yeah, you don't have to buy them. Yeah. If you do want to buy them, I 
Where can you see the best? I'm outside again. There we go. Um, the Easy Chuck has a set, which is what I was using on the uh, cold jaws in the beginning. I don't remember the price, around 30 bucks. And um, well, Penn State Industries actually has two different sizes. One is a inch and a half long, and one is two and a half inches long. And these will fit on Nova and Stronghold, whereas the easy pins will only fit the easy jaws uh, because of the thread. Um, these are metric, and the easy jaws are um, SAE. So again, this is Penn State. Uh, these use an M6 one screw and this uses a quarter 20. So there's a there's a way to get them, you know, it's, I don't know, $30. Um, uh, Joe, I think you bought some of these when I did the uh, demo before. Um, I did. At, uh, at the Grand Rapids Club, was that is that about the right number? Is twenty nine yep. thirty bucks? Yep, I think they were thirty bucks. So, is there any other questions on alternate ways to mount that box? No, good information though on the pins, Bruce. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to run over here, so I'm hurrying a little bit. I uh, might skip a few of the steps to try to get them all in for you. Uh, the next thing to do is to um, make the base for the box. And what I'm doing is I'm using a stronghold, uh, their number three jaws, which measures just under four inches across, but I take a pair of calipers and get that measurement because I'm going to need that in a second. So for this maneuver, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the face of the jaws as my drive to turn the raw piece of wood that I'm going to use for my blank. And uh, so what I did is I've cut this round on the bandsaw and um, Mark Center, I, I did that for uh, cutting it. I have a circle cutter on my bandsaw, which makes it easy. So if I mark center, I can get a pretty good circle. And then um, I use the tailstock to do two things. Apply pressure on the blank against the chuck for the drive, and also to hold the blank in center on the lathe as it's spinning. First thing is to bring it round. Same thing, I'm going to roll the tool into the cut. So I'm doing a space, and I'm rolling the tool up so that the gouge can do its work. I want to take a little deeper cut. Can you, top, top, can you get the top camera, Bruce? There you go. Let's start over. I want a little deeper cut. My tool rest is in the way. I've got to change the tool rest.
I want to get the bevel on the tool pointed in the direction I want to go. Let me shave out some of my old grooves I made. There we go. Now I'm opening it up so it can cut. Like a I still got a flat in there. Oh, just the green. Bring the rest around. You want the rest to be right at center to do this marking process. I use my calipers to mark the wood, and the way I do that is the um, I let the left leg touch the wood, and the right leg is just for visual comparison. I don't let it touch the wood. If it touches the wood, it'll fling the calipers right at me. So is that a good view? Maybe. Let's see. Oh, sorry. Zoom out. Can you zoom out the other one? Or that one? Okay. That side, is that all right? Yeah, that's good. So my first thing is I'm just letting the leg put a scratch in there so I can see where I am. And I'm not quite where I want to be, so i got to move the leg out a little further. There we go. I'll just press it in. And that's my limit for my tenon for the chuck that I'm going to use. Got to bring the tool rest back down. Go back to your overhead. There we go. Well, it's the same deal. I'm going to do a scraping cut first. And then I'm going to roll the tool into the wood. And that gives me that shoulder for the bevel of the right hand. That's a drawback of using the cup jaws there. Right? They don't have as much grip as something else makes. <laughs> this is a very old piece of um, poplar. It came out of a house that was built in 1862. It does have some unique cutting. So this is my uh, tub dovetail tool that I ground myself so that I can make the proper dovetail for my truck. And uh, what I do with it is the point does most of the cutting. So I'll start the point and let and slide it across. What's the company? It, their slogan is simple and quick. Modernistic, simple and quick. Modernistic, that's it. Simple and quick. Give me the words. I'll figure out the slogan. I'll figure out. The <laughs> <laughs> you guys watch TV too much. <laughs> so 
Doug, your little switcher is getting all covered up with chips. <laughs> uh, hopefully that'll be okay. All right. Now what, huh? We're going back to that blank that we half hauled. And I'm getting ready to make the tenon that's going to go inside of the box and become the base. So I want to do the same trick in terms of marking out how big that tenon should be. So let's see, let's try top. There we go. So what I've got is a set of calipers that I span across there. That'll work. So that I can mark the same way I did for the uh, dovetail tenon or the chuck tenon. Slide your tailstock back and use your side camera to show us this. There you go. Oh, we can see it. Okay. Same thing. The left leg touches the wood. The right is just for a visual comparison. I'm going to go out further. Press it in a little bit. Get a nice cut. Back to my uh, Ellsworth gouge. Starting to do a space there, and I'll start to roll. Now, what I'm doing is I'm locking the tool with my thumb so it can't back away. So I'm doing a scrape. I'm not taking a huge cut here. And I start to roll the tool so that that wing comes around and gives me a better scrape and also produces the shoulder for the double of the tool to ride on. I'm going up to that mark that I put in. I'm going to take one more cut because I want a little bit bigger thinning than I got. I want to do a test fit. Unfortunately, it's big. If it was small, then that's a problem. <clears throat> Going back to my um, square negative break scraper. Now I'm going to put a little bit of an angle on the tenon. To help me get the uh, final size and alignment. You see it just will cover that little bevel that I cut in there. So that tells me that all i got to do is match the smallness of the bevel. And I can tell when I'm up to full because I'm watching the size of the uh, curl that's coming off.
And so that's a little tight. You want to leave some room for glue. Bruce, t turn that tool sideways a little bit so I can see the side. Uh, there you go. OK. That's a little bit like a bedan or? Yeah, really, you could use a bedan. But the problem with the bedan is it's a cutting tool. And if you use it as a scraper, you dull the hell out of it. Whereas a negative rake scraper is literally built to be dulled. So I'm kind of funny about that. You know, um, Stuart Batty wanted us to bring um, our conventional ground skews. There we go. Wanted us to bring our conventional ground skews to the workshop because we were going to use them as scrapers. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I do a lot of work to get a nice um, sharp skew. And I didn't like the idea of using it for a scraper. So I actually took a negative rate scraper. So then the next step would be to sand this, which I'm not going to do. So you could um, take a light scraping cut across there, clean it up. This is rough sawn. Clean it up and sand it. And then you would glue that on. And again, you could use the uh, um, you could use that cone that I had on the live center to clamp the piece on while I do. But this will become your bottom. And one of the most important parts of this is that this surface needs to be flat. Um, let's go top. All right. So um, if I was to glue that box on right now, you can see I got a little bit of an airspace in there, which means this surface is coming in on an angle. Uh, that would not give me a real good glue joint. Plus, I would probably end up with a gap between the base and the body of the box. So I could refine that but I'm not going to right now because we're already at almost to noon and we're not quite done. But that's the process. And then when you glue, you want to, um, you want to put a lot of glue on this surface and also a lot of glue on the mating surface. And you can put glue on the sides of the tenon. If you put glue inside the box, when you slide the box on there, the tenon's going to scrape that glue and push it to the inside of the box. And so you'll end up with a lot of um, squeeze out in the bottom of your box. So if you just put the glue on the tenon on this surface, and the flat surface of the box, you'll get a nice glue up and you won't have all that glue to clean up in the bottom of your box when you're done. Questions? Oh, come on. I feel like I'm talking to myself. Are these working? Yep, everything's working. Okay. I, I, wasn't getting any, I wasn't getting any sound, so I thought maybe they died on me. What's no, you were just doing such a good job explaining. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> we're in awe, Bruce. What's yeah. that, Bruce? So through the magic of TV cooking, there's our glued up box with a base on it. And so the next step would be to hollow this. And I guess I better do it. I'm sorry, I'm running over time. Do 
Zoom will probably charge us extra for the overtime. There's a lot of uh, the guys that have made them. I know Steve's made some of these and John Brennan has made some of these boxes. And I think they can attest to you that there's a lot of steps to it. They're fun projects, but there are a lot of steps. Everything all clear. Uh, one of the things with a negative break scooper is you can go in and out. I wouldn't recommend it with a gout. How do you like that sound? Said that. <laughs> Doug did. I'm coaching you. <laughs> Good. be careful in that step not to hit the bottom right um yeah you should but you're gonna you'll scar the bottom the bottom at this point would be sanded and ready for finish so you wouldn't want to scar it check make sure I'm kind of square now the top's not as important as the bottom in terms of square yeah that's pretty good so I would sand that now which I'm not going to do you guys will just have to imagine you see me sanding the next step is to make the lid Well, you can watch me struggling there. For the lid, I'm going to take my blank. This is a piece of um, two inch roughs on tulip poplar. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to use the chuck as my drive. <clears throat> I'm going to put a tenon on one side, turn it around so that I can. Uh, shape the inside of the lid. One of the things that's important about the lids is to try to keep them light. 
because you have little children that are very sick handling these and um, they can't always uh, lift much weight. So if you got a real heavy lid, it uh, makes it more of a challenge for them. Let the uh, left leg hit the wood. There we go. Same thing, scraping cap, rolling good. Now the wood that's going to be in the uh, chuck tenon will eventually become part of the wood that's the knob. Yep, just a note to everybody who's hanging on in the meeting here. We do have some free giveaways that will be given away at the end of this. So uh, if you can, hang on out here until the end of this demo so we can uh, hand out all of our free prizes. Is it one of those box tool rest? <laughs> <laughs> I'd put my knee back on the wheel if that was the case. <laughs> Uh, in terms of the length of the demo, it's probably about another 15 minutes that uh, works for everybody. So, where are we? So, what I'm doing again, I'm measuring the inside of the box. So I know how big to make the tenon on the lid. <clears throat> um, now what I do here, because I'm going to turn the lid on the box as the final step, I want the, the lid to be a tight fit. So I'm going to actually have to push it on so that that helps drive the lid when I'm doing the turning. And then after I've got it all turned, I'll sand inside the box to loosen the lid up so the lid can rattle in the box and be easy to lift off. Same thing, I'm going to roll into it. Hey, adjust your camera. Which camera you want? Oops. Adjust that one. There, there we go. go. I'm going to roll into the cut. 
open the tool up. I want a fairly long tenon on this one, so I also want a, be a bevel on it to help the kid be able to stick the lid in. So I put a bevel, but it hasn't gone all the way to the shoulder of the lid. What do you think? I don't know, Doug, your switcher keeps getting covered up with chips. Okay. So at this point, I just simply turn the whole thing around. Get my tail stock support. Now, one of the things you have to keep in mind here is you've got grain orientation in two ways. In the box, it's in spindle fashion, so it's running the length of the lathe, but in the base and the lid, it's cross grain or faceplate work. So these areas, you need to use bowl gouge. You can use bowl gouge on the spindle work, but you don't want to use a spindle tool on the faceplate wood. So I'm going to start out with a bowl gouge because I just want to bring these down more to the box size. Well, Bruce, I do have a question. Do you have a handout with the steps involved that you can send to me that I can forward to everybody? Uh, I have it partially put together. i got to finish it up and then I'll send it to you. All right, we will get one out this week. Yep. So I'm going to roll into the cut. You camera, top camera. Well, I could use the bowl gouge to um, flatten the um, the body of the box off, but I really prefer a uh, roughing out gouge.
But because of time, I'm not going to spend a lot of um, time in shaping and sanding and all that, but I do want to show you how to form the lid. I also did not hollow inside the lid, which I should have done. But I'm kind of pushing the time thing a little bit. So now I'm just going to shape the lid. Are you hollowing the inside of the lid for aesthetics or to make it lighter? Make it lighter. But it's a great opportunity to put some aesthetics in there. Uh, one of the things when you hollow the lid, you got to keep in mind where you hollow as you're shaping the outside, or the next thing you know, you might have a uh, physical bowl would be a funnel. One of the things I really like about the Ellsworth grind is you can remove a lot of wood in a hurry. I'm cutting a lot of wood. But all that drive is coming from the friction fit between the lid and the box. This is why I wanted a tight lid. This is a great opportunity right here to get a check. to watch the wings and the scouts so that they don't run into something you don't want them to run into and overfeed. So at this point, I go to my detail gouge, it's safe, even though it's a spindle tool, this is a safe operation because of the, um, the size of the piece at this point. Bruce, Yo. can you switch to the side camera? This top camera is like buffering really bad for some reason. Oh, I know why. It looks good on your end. Must be for some reason coming through Zoom, it's buffered really bad. Well, now it looks okay. Okay. I switched, out, I switched out and came back into it. I don't know if that'll do it. Uh, it's still bad. Oh. Right. Go, to, go, to, go to the side view and let's watch that camera. Now do it. Okay. I'm using a bowl job right now. There's all kinds of designs for your knob. What I'm doing is I'm leaving a, a ridge in there. I'm gonna, I will soften that with the sandpaper when I sand it. This makes it easier for some small fingers to uh, get underneath of that and they have something to pull on when they don't have a lot of strength to actually squeeze. when you really get to test 
How much drive is friction you got? And get rid of that dimple. I'm just going to kind of hollow this down. And what I'm doing is I'm making a soft start, so I'm on the bubble before I start to cut. Take the top of this. Get on the bubble. I pull the tool back. I stay on the bubble, but I pull the tool back to get it cutting. And I open it up a little bit. Follow the contour around. At that point, um, I would finish that up with some sandpaper just to take the sharp edges off. Well, one of the things I like about doing a demo from home is I got all my tools. And then I would sand, you know, besides sanding the lid, besides sanding the lid and sanding the outside of the box, it's ready for finish. And uh, at that point, after I've done the sanding, I'll turn the box around back into my cold jaws and finish the bottom. We're out of time. All right. Any questions? Great job. Awesome job, Bruce. Cool. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Fantastic job, Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. Uh, if, if there's enough fellows that want to do it, um, we could actually have a Zoom bead box workshop and uh, deal with questions and whatever at okay. a later date. Thank you, Doug. All right. Thank you, Bruce. We really Bruce. appreciate it. Great job. Um, all right. Let's Bruce. do some, let's do some yeah. uh, um,